Hey there everybody, P.T. Pop here with All Four Lobes of My Brain, securely bound behind my back, and welcome back to another episode of P.T. Pop, A Mind Revolution, where I lead you out of the rabbit hole, one grain of truth at a time. I'm really excited about today's show because I have a phenomenal artist from Columbus, Ohio, and her name is Fatima Taylor. Her maiden name is Azimova, and she was born in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, in the former USSR, and she now lives here in Ohio, and she's just an amazing artist. I love her work. It's it's beautiful. It's vibrant. It's exciting to look at, and you'll love to see her work here. If you'd like to see Fatima's beautiful work and you want to watch our interview, just click on the link in the description. It'll take you right to my YouTube channel. We can watch it in its entirety and see her beautiful, beautiful artwork. Just check it out. Just go and look for PT Pop on YouTube or look for Skating Bear Studios. I've got it posted in both places. Fatima, thanks so much for being on the show today. And welcome to PT Pop and Mind Revolution. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. It's uh, really exciting to talk with you because I've been looking at your work more since we last spoke and I don't even know where to begin sometimes, but it's, it's really beautiful work. So you're originally from the USSR. Is that, that's considered the Soviet union, correct? Correct. Uzbekistan is a former USSR Republic. And for quite a few years, over 70 years, it belonged to uh, United with Russia and uh, together 15 republics joined together. Mm -hmm. And uh, Uzbekistan um, was uh, uh, separated in 1991, uh, gained independence. And since 1991, it became an independent country. Yeah. And you now reside in Reynoldsburg, Ohio? Correct. So how long have you been in, in the United States? When did you first come here? I immigrated to the United States in 2001, before September 11, actually in the first week of April. So, oh wow, uh, yeah. So, you were here when 9 11 happened, then correct? So that, that had to be pretty shocking for oh, it was absolutely devastating. I remember watching news and walking outside and looking at the sky and thinking, Is this the last time I see a peaceful sky? It was absolutely shocking, very unexpected, and terrifying. I know, I, I've never looked at the sky the same way since. So is it's really affected how I look at the at the world in more ways than, than just the sky. But yeah, it's been it was really it's traumatic. Really been such a crazy time. Uh, yeah, it's just it's remarkable in the good way and historical way. I mean, we're we're thinking our kids, our grandkids, will look back in a history yeah. and <laughs> research and study us and the time. <laughs> we yeah. yeah, that's true. Um, I was reading through your bio, your bio, and I have a very important question. Um, how did you come to name your dog Cheese? <laughs> um, beautiful story. My son Max, my older son Max, uh, bought Cheese, and he he's always he loves Shiba Inu. Cheese is Shiba Inu, mini Shiba Inu. And one time when I went on vacation, he knew exactly that there's no way I'm going to have a pet in the house. You know, it was the schedule crazy, no pet in the house. And he surprised me was a baby Shiba. And because of the color, I guess he decided to call him cheese as an American orange color kind of orange red cheese. Oh, nice. uh, that's the inspiration. But so I adopted him as he was. And from then on, he's going to be, he's turned seven, actually seven years old. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. I love Shiba Inus. We've, we've got a German shepherd that they say is part sh chow, but I think she's part Shiba Inu. But I just think they're the cutest dogs. I uh, I, have a, I subscribe to a channel on Instagram where these uh, people make their Shiba Inu do all these really silly little things. So Me too. I follow them obsessively. And they they look very cute but you know don't get me wrong that they are very stubborn and mm -hmm. strong personality they're hunters so mm -hmm. not as cute as you think they look you know they're yeah. not yeah. Yeah. yeah so as i'm looking through your bio um it says here that you you your passion for painting and drawing started at a very young age how young were you when you knew that you loved art and you loved painting 
it's hard to say. I think even when I, I mean, I remember my mother used to say that our walls were covered with scratches and uh, crayons and pencil lines. I guess as soon as I held my pencil or even crayon or anything that you can possibly scrape a line, I start on intuitive level just drawing and scribbling and doing something but i don't remember a time when i didn't draw or paint or did anything with my hands so the urge of creating something whether it's three-dimensional or painting or drawing working with mud or something it was always constant there and there was never mm -hmm. a question whether i will be an artist or not it was present so when you were growing up your first part of your life in russia and, uh, you know, all I know about Russia is what they teach us in our history classes and through the media. And I'd always heard that they would suppress artists and they would put people in jail for being artists and stuff like that. Did you see that? Did did you see artists getting in trouble for being artists before you moved over here? Most important, of course, the subject matter was control. You know, there wasn't such a freedom of expression. It was control. And you grow up in the environment where as a child, you learn to not be expressive and it becomes a norm. And only mm -hmm. at the age of, you know, adulthood, especially when you leave the country, you realize looking back, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, what, what was it like? I know you had some trouble ad adjusting to American culture, but it must have felt free, freeing to be here as an artist because I'm sure you were conscientious of what you could say and what you couldn't say in your artwork. I'm, I don't think you were a political artist, but did it feel freeing here that you were finally here where you could do what you wanted uh, <laughs> or not? I don't think I can ever feel that I'm completely free and I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of sense of um, more of expression, support in the artistic community. Absolutely. America is a diversified country with different languages and cultures. And mm -hmm. it was, in fact, I felt a lot more at home being in the United States because I grew up in diverse uh, cultural diverse family. My mother is from Armenia. She's half Russian, half Armenian. My father was Uzbek and Tatar. So the the tension between Islamic religion and Christianity was always present in my family. And mm -hmm. throughout my childhood, I felt different, not belonging either to uh, Russian side or Armenian mm -hmm. side or nor to Uzbek side. So being in the United States and feeling um, closer and belonging to even being foreign was pretty um a new discovery, different experience. So I'm very happy and I feel like this is my country and I feel very welcome. Now you you found me through my documentary, The Artist. And I appreciate you watching that. And but I also found we have Ohio University in common. And and forgive me, I I I know you teach there now or you used to teach at Ohio U. So I taught. Okay. For quite a few years in regional campuses, uh, Chillicothe, mm -hmm. Central, and Lancaster. And then I applied for a graduate school uh, for MFA program. And when I was accepted, so currently I'm a second year graduate student. And as a graduate student, I also teach as well uh, studio art. Yes. But I do have experience of teaching in Chinese State University, uh, introduction to art and also studio art, painting, drawing, and also in Ohio University. So just wow. going to school and receiving the American master's degree in fine art is, um, in my mind, valuable experience, you know, at my age and uh, as, a, as a foreign student. Well, actually, I applied as American student. Mm -hmm. uh, English is my second language. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it says here you were awarded the Graduate Recruitment Scholarship and Graduate Assistant Correct. at Ohio University. What what are those? It sounds sounds pretty prestigious. It's uh, pretty much free tuition and you get uh, a stipend as well. So, yeah. But with that, um, you have to maintain your higher GPA, of course. You have to be, uh, you have to do well. But uh, it's not that hard. You know, it, I think... At my age, I love I love the world of academia. I love studying, learning, and being um, you know observing all, each lesson. And the teachers are super smart and very passionate. And 
it's such a pleasant experience. And so you don't have a website. So where can people go to find your work? They can find me uh, on social media, Instagram and Facebook, preferably social media and Instagram, because I often post my newest work or sometimes sketches or research or study ideas on Instagram. Okay, great. And so we had spoken a little bit before this and, and I'd ask you who your inspirations were. And you said postage stamps inspired you the work the artwork on postage stamps and i'll bring i'm going to bring up let me bring up your work here so what's the title of this work and um what so is the significance uh, behind the stamps behind behind the child there's that your son no it's actually me self-portrait based on my older black and white photograph wow. so this is the image of me of course i painted um it is acrylic on canvas and also while well, it is uh, mixed media actually because the collage the stamps on the background is collage um so they're in they're not of course a real size of the stamps they are um enlarged and it's basically paper glued on, on canvas mm -hmm. so stamps were my first exposure to art um, mm -hmm. when i was a child i collected cards calendars and postal cards and but i began with postal stamps because you know at that time sending mails and cards and letters was such a common and my mother was in the she was a president in international club and school and herself and students were corresponding with different students from outside of the country, uh, foreign students. And so I've witnessed a lot of different uh, postal stamps and I began paying attention to design and font and colors and symbols and the iconography of each. Of course, mm -hmm. I couldn't always understand, but I was so attracted and fascinated by the design and miniature of the artwork. And that was my first collection. And um, in this particular portrait, I was trying to depict similar age of my interest to postal stamps and the postal stamps on the background. However, the title is slightly different because you can't see it, but there are words written all, 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 all around the, the head mm -hmm. on the side. Yeah. And those are the fragments of the lyrics from a child son, childhood son um, song was let it always be a sunshine. Uh, one of my favorite songs during my childhood. And I just wanted to, because the message was, you know, there are some, uh, some of the fragments of uh, more propaganda-like statements of the stamps. A lot of them were pro very propagandistic, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. many other images. But as a child, of course, I couldn't read that message. I saw the beauty and the, the brilliance of design. Anyway, the title of the song, uh, the the painting is the "Let It Always Be a Sunshine." Oh, how wild! Because I would have never guessed that. That's, I mean, it, it's the backdrop is just fascinating. The collage of stamps, but in a way, now that you mention it, it does look kind of like a propaganda poster in a way from the <laughs> old Soviet Union, maybe. No yeah. offense. I don't mean that to be offensive, but no, no, no. It, no, it strikes me as one of those Chairman Mao shirts that he would wear or um i don't know but the color scheme is very um sad in a way is it supposed to be kind of sad well i i love color blue and it can be very sad it can be very pure and very bold and very aggressive even but in this mm -hmm. case it's it brings a lot of contrast to this kind of faded brown mm -hmm rustic color mm -hmm. uh, so i purposefully wanted to go away from more realistic depiction of a color of course the child normally is depicted with you know all bright red but here it's more like a faded memory of this image of a childhood me back in the past and color of a blue adds a little bit of nostalgia a little bit of you know a lost memory and mm -hmm. It also goes well as a complementary color to the brown, this rustic brown color. Yep. Yeah, so it's, it's a beautiful more strategic um, choice of a color, but also, you know, to me, I am a colorist. I love colors and they mm -hmm. do represent a lot of meanings and different, uh, of course, different uh, painting. I but find that your, your color schemes 
are just fascinating. And uh, this this next piece, I think, is one of your teachers or a professor. Julie, she's in my committee. It's a committee member. She's not yeah. my teacher. Yeah, she's okay. actually director in our program. Yeah. Yeah, so this is just, I've noticed you, you do a couple things in, in some of these portraits where you really emphasize the eyes. And in this one specifically, you, um, it's almost not pointless, but you use suggested the brush strokes and suggested colors in almost a pointless way. Cause you, if you pull away from it, it kind of all visually blends together, but it's, you, you must have fun, um, feelings for this person because you you portray here almost looking like a whimsical little half smile her eyes are very emphasized and the eyes are just beautiful you're just like drawn to them automatically thank you peter i love faces i'm so yeah. attracted to human forms especially especially faces I think my diverse cultural background, you know, taught me how to pay attention to noses and eyes, you know, traveling from one side of a country to another and noticing, you know, all this skins and type of facial profiles. But uh, to answer your question, yes, I am obsessed with Julie's face <laughs> and the way she looks. Her yes. gaze is just staring and looking through you. Yeah. She Super sweet and very, I was trying to capture her personality. She's very easygoing and sweet and kind and absolutely loving and charming lady. But when you talk to her, you realize how smart and intelligent and, and there is a fundamental like metal structure underneath that holds everything together. So she's very strong and powerful and there are so many different layers of you know, complexity. And that's what I was trying to depict that nothing simple about this lady. And so in character. And so I'm going to go to another piece here. This one in, in contrast, I, I think is, this is a self portrait, correct? Correct. And, and, and I, I asked you what inspired the color scheme. And I, I don't know <laughs> if you said, did you say acid indigestion or something to me? Acid reflex. Acid flea. <laughs> Reflex. <laughs> <laughs> Is, I don't, were you just being funny? I'm guessing. No, well, you know, it, it, every joke has a little bit of joke, right? So uh, yeah, yeah. there's some truth to it, of yeah. course. When I think about colors, you know, of course, uh, when I paint, I use every tool, line, texture, color, contrast. Everything plays role, you know. As sometimes it looks accidental, nothing is accidental. I manipulate every um, form to achieve certain quality and certain emotional state. So color, of course, is extremely powerful. I Last fall, I was experimenting with neon bright colors, and I wanted to achieve that um, strong kind of almost vulgar re reaction um and didn't necessarily like the neon color itself but in combination of other tones gray and light purple it kind of speaks very loud and in this case i wanted to look as a flame or acid flame on the background so when you look at the portrait yes the the figure staring at you directly yet with your side vision, you notice you can't not notice this acidic flame around that, and it's over over overwhelming and overpowering. That is completely it's competing with the audio with the model itself. So that mm -hmm. conflict and tension that's what I appreciate or what I'm trying to achieve. The pose of a model is in such a contrast with the background, and it adds this dynamic flame, looking like more unpredictable. Um, state yeah i mean the thing i noticed with this is that the expression on your face is very serious to me oh. anyway but you don't look like that in the photographs i've seen if you're looking serious your skin tones are almost gray True. and and uh but but it's it almost looks like you're floating in um a laser or fire yellow fire but the right. color schemes, so you you actually think these color schemes out ahead of time. Absolutely. Uh, I That's mean, for great. the past few years, I almost never want to depict 
a figure the way they look in real life. Of course, I follow some proportions and, you know, likability. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's such a huge room for experiments. And again, using the color and values to tonal values to really express the personality or current state of mind feelings or certain mood that I was trying to depict. But I think you were, you are spot on with the the attitude was there and I wanted to depict that. Did you, you did. Mm -hmm. You have a certain color scheme you go through on most of your paintings. Go to this next one here. There's a lot of pastels, but in this one, (laughs) I mean, your progression of work, and I don't know what years, what years these are, but you've gone, you've gone from more of an impressionistic portraiture style to this surreal, I guess you would call it surrealistic or surrealism, or what, what do you call that? So this particular is not surrealism, and it was completed last summer. Uh, actually beginning of fall semester, the first year in grad school. Mm -hmm. The previous two portraits were completed also during the first year. Uh, So it's relatively new other than the the childhood painting was much older, but the for the past past three paintings were relatively new. This is a drawing. It's actually a paper, a marker, colorful markers and pen on paper is a drawing. I love drawings. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you asked me earlier whether I prefer just painting or other medium and drawing is equally important for me. In fact, a drawing, I call it as a thinking process. You know, I have tons of sketches and before I even, not always, but most of the time, it is important for me to record my ideas through smaller or larger sketches. Mm -hmm. This is a large sketch, about 30 inches. And I have a series of those uh, doodling and turning to this expression, you know, emotional expression. And a lot of times I think about you know, through the distortion of a body and bright colors, all this uh, expressive. Um, I use pink here as n- not as a uh, pleasant, feminine, exciting color, but more as like um, repelling and kind of sickening color to contrast the green and just mm. to go on with the, the emotions uh, I was trying to depict. And the face is more like a mask rather than mm-hmm. real human and face. And you can see the background through uh, the eyes and kind of indicates the the almost emptiness or the hollowness of the figure. And it's lacking some limbs and kind of dissected almost. So it adds more fragility and uh, life less um, to the character. It almost looks like the the subject is is tormented, exactly, or, or in anguish or some sort. So what? I don't know if you know the psychology behind why you picked this. Was there an intent behind expressing something like this, or was did it? Is it just what happened as you drew? And it doesn't always have to be a particular clear message. You know, this is about you know blue sky and green grass and. It is more about state of mind that I had at that time. However, looking back, and often I want my audience to look and perhaps recognize that they may be in the similar state of mind and think about the the hollowness and this emptiness and the crickedness and all this awkwardness that they feel recognizing that and being connected on their personal level was this work, you know? Well, I think another thing I noticed here is that the placement of the subject on the canvas makes it look like uh, he or she is trapped in a box and is is almost in in a crate or something like that. That's to how I see it. I mean, it may not be, but the, the placement just creates that tension of the walls are closing in on that uh, subject. Now, now, this one blows me away because it's cubist, right? Cubist in nature. It may look cubistic for somebody. And I, you know, honestly, there's no such a thing as a wrong terminology. You say what it looks like to you and you can Mm -hmm. interpret it in the way you want. And listen, my door is open to anyone's interpretation. Mm -hmm. I will never be offended if it looks cubism to you or impressionism or realism. That's perfectly fine. But I was guided by the mosaic. In Uzbekistan, um, all the republics of Stan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, um, 
the folk art is very well developed. And one of the biggest tradition using ceramics and tiles and mosaic, of course, if you're mm -hmm. familiar with the style of uh, mosques, how they mm -hmm. look blue colors of mosaic. So I grew up seeing that and being very inspired. I always wanted to learn how to do that, but never actually had a chance. But the visual uh, interpretation, the way the color flows and how the shape transforms, um, I was inspired by that. So it looks like mosaic, but it is actually watercolor markers on paper and mm -hmm. on, uh, watercolor paper. And it, and it flows like water. There's almost like a water feeling to it. Um, almost like in the bottom right, like a whirlpool of like all the water's coming down and just swirling in this bottom right hand corner between the two um, busts. We got a similar theme uh, as the from two paintings ago. And, you know, these remind me a little bit of where wild things are. I think I mentioned that down on uh, Instagram. I don't know if you're familiar with that children's book. Um, but the, have you ever considered getting these animated, like getting giving them to an animator and turning them into live creatures? That would be great. Would that, that would be, be something? Fantastic. Yes. I mean, this yeah. is just amazing. The, I mean, just the the colors and the textures and the again, it feels like a monster trapped in a box <laughs> of flames or something. I I don't even know how to put this. Is just I just am blown away by the colors and the composition. I, you would laugh if I tell you actually, actually what was the inspiration. The inspiration was <laughs> portrait by self portrait. I this was is the self portrait, out, right? I was thinking about. I look at myself in the mirror. I can't stand self portraits. I hate them. Um, but you know, and I have no problem to depict the distortion of body and how you, you really feel. And I like that. I like to play with proportions and you know have intention to kind of have a broken tormented or so and it's very playful you know my first job was a cartoonist uh, I wasn't as a main cartoonist but I'm very familiar with the old-fashioned cartoon and drawing the phases and how the movement and how the the locomotion of character created so uh, but idea of turning this into cartoon is really exciting thank you Oh, it's beautiful. I, mean, I just love the hair. If, if, is that hair? Yes. It looks like he's going into the wind, like the wind yes, is blowing. blowing his hair. and Blowing. Yes. Yeah. It's just uh, just the overall composition, just the way the canvas is broken up. And it's just so there's so many things that keep you in the canvas, too. There's, you know, a lot of paintings are boring and they you know you you're let off the canvas and you you don't want to look at it anymore but this one you're stuck <laughs> in it it's like a maze of uh of textures and shapes and colors okay so here's this is your husband correct correct this paul. is scott paul so paul that was scott okay so i was so this is more of a realistic portrait mm-hmm but you've got symbolism all throughout this that must be pre must pertain to him or or to both of you, like with the elephant and the eagle. And there's a four leaf clover. I, I don't know if he is he Irish. Yes. OK. Partially Irish. He has Lithuanian, Italian, Irish. Yeah. Yes. So what um, what do the animals sim symbolize? No, it's beautiful work, too, because you really. You know, when I contrast it to to your friend, the the lady, who mm -hmm. looked whimsical, he looks kind of almost uh, not sad, but he's kind of like uh, looking, like pondering life or something. So, did oh. you? Did, is he kind of a very deep person? Very. He can be. He's an analyst. He works uh, at the Chase, J.P. Morgan and Chase Bank, and he's okay. an analyst. So his profession, his job requires him to be um, very focused and, you know, sometimes in the very deep focus. But overall, he's absolutely happy and funny and incredibly diverse person as well. He, oh, good. He's a very talented in art as well. He doesn't have very much experience, but he is a great draftsman and he has some experience with me painting. But for this portrait, actually, this is a fragment. The drawing is slightly large. This is a drawing, color, pencil on paper. 
Wow. If you zoom in uh, at some point, you can see the very small, teeny, tiny. You know, I'm a maximalist. I'm obsessed with the tiny, tiny details. And ever mm. since my childhood, drawing, sometimes I do doodling, sketching, and rough, kind of r- harsh lines. But sometimes I go into this obsessive detailing that I just dive in and I can't even stop. And with color pencils, it, it sometimes pulls you in and, and you you can be submerged with all these layers because with the modern technology, you can use all kinds of different uh, blending tools and blending liquids to blend the layers of color. So it creates a smooth, uh, almost realistic effect. You literally can achieve a quality of a photography. I wasn't trying to do that in this one, mm-hmm. but to answer your question, the symbolism behind, yes, it's again, intuitive. The ego on the left side, certainly reminds me this strong profile of my husband beautiful italian nose and the the mm-hmm. posture and this eyes the gaze how he's sometimes staring at something when he's thinking mm-hmm. and looking at his face certainly reminds me this mm, wild nature of a eagle the the clover leaf is Maybe too direct, but it's kind of good luck. And it, many years ago, I found five leaf clover. Mm. And I know you, if you can find four leaf clover, mm-hmm. you consider yourself lucky. Imagine me finding five leaf clover. So mm-hmm. this is a five leaf clover to me. <laughs> he is my five leaf clover, you know. How about the elephant? What is the elephant? The support? elephant is. To, well, in many countries, it is a symbol of power, wealth, prosperity. Um, but here, to me, it it is a symbol of the powerful nature, kindness, and this majesty. You know, huge, monumental creature that has such a strong presence. Now, this is the mural down in Hilliard, Ohio, correct? Correct. And this is big because you look dwarfed in comparison to the size of this so tell us behind this how did you get commissioned to do this and and how long did it take you to make it andy warnock was um he commissioned me to paint this uh, large mural and actually this mural is facing brand new basketball course indoor basketball and uh, volleyball course that he just built Mm -hmm. and He's uh, such a wonderful entrepreneur and a great young businessman in Hilliard, Ohio. And he met me through uh, some um, art uh, art community and we talk about the ideas. And when I submitted the sketch, watercolor sketch, his idea was basically to depict um, a large mural that celebrates youth and athletic um, success in the young community and the idea was the title for this mural is higher goals and i was trying to celebrate the the athletic young kids who are you know actually in the center this is uh the owner himself and his family and this celebration of success and uh, Mm -hmm. large basket net kind of place higher to and of course it's enlarged it's like a giant sun as like a planet symbolizing this um success yeah oh that's excellent how long did it take you to paint probably maybe two months wow three months Uh, so mural outdoor mural is very different than indoor because you don't really control you don't control nature Mm -hmm. Uh, there was construction going on on the side, so I had to kind of avoid the days, the busy days or dusty days. So it's really, I would think, roughly three months. Wow, that's a long time. It's just really, I love the placement of the characters and the juxtaposition of the family in the center with the players around it. So it's it's really well thought out again. And uh, the color choices are beautiful, too. Thank you. So this is basically uh, a few images that um, are larger canvas. Excuse me, is it called Resilience Unbound? 
the title for the exhibition, it's I I'm just thinking about suggesting an exhibition that will be titled Resilient Unbounds and then Navigating the Dynamic of Power. Resilience mm. Unbound, Navigating the Dynamics of Power. I love that. And so the I current subject is is more about um oppression, power dynamics, and the control. You know, I'm trying to um find a narrative that captures the, the essence and uh, as you see the style has changed slightly oh There's yeah more abstract elements and more mm -hmm. drawing looking like and uh this is actually a drawing original drawing larger uh drawing with just a basic very basic markers and a is very that, is that russian in the center of the screen in the center of the, it is right what's yeah, that say? Always tell the truth it says always tell the truth Always oh, say say that in Russian for me. I want to hear you speak. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a larger canvas. It's six by nine feet. I think it's actually seven by ten feet large canvas. So it's kind of rolled. It's not stretched on frame. It's just roll. I have a large wall in my studio where I can stretch large canvases. I mean, this is such a such a departure from what you've been doing. This I would never even guess. Like. If you put all these in a room, I would never guess this was your work. It's so different. I completely agree. But, you know, when I signed up with the MFA program, when I went to back to school, uh, grad school, uh -huh. I promised myself that I'm not going to paint something that I know for sure will work, that I know I can be, I know I can paint faces and figures, and I know I'm good at, you know, spend so many years perfecting the skill mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but when i went to school i thought no i have to experiment reinvent myself rebuild discover dig deeper and it's no longer a goal for me it was not a longer a goal to create something recognizable and beautiful and aesthetically pleasing you know i want to go into the depths and dig out the truth and put it on canvas and it's huge risk because the goal isn't um to appreciate the beauty of aesthetics. No, the goal is to tell the truth and show the truth and relate to the audience. And, you know, a very different challenge. And it, it kind of turned my vision. So I, I'm in the process of exploring and expressing. And this is my studio. And actually, oh, wow. yeah. I am sitting right this wall in this painting. So this is my desk. Oh, you that's where we are right now. Oh, okay. it's right behind me. Yeah, exactly. Let me, do you mind if I comment on, on this piece? Sure, absolutely. Feel free. So, so it, it, it has all kinds of symbolism in it. And it mm -hmm. seems like if it's always tell the truth, I'm guessing that blood has been spilled for people to tell the truth. Because there's <laughs> lots of blood in this. It seems like they're sitting in this is just my weird imagination, but I'm guessing there's looks like somebody's gagged and blindfolded. Yes. There's blood. There's almost looks like somebody stretched out in a rack on a, I don't know. I'm right. It's either this is more about my weird brain or I'm reading into it too much or am I on the same, on the right track or. Correct. It is. It is uh, certainly bright red color has very powerful interpretation and we always associate with you know, dynamic it, it is a bloody and especially when it's diluted with uh water and it's certainly color of a fleshy body fluid like to the point of you know it's kind of repulsive and sickening especially to contrast with this neon yellow normally you would not place this to color to achieve a calm harmony where some poetic peaceful looking like work mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. intentionally you know provokes to this kind of um disturbing you know really mm -hmm. disturbing state of mind uh it looks like a neon light coming through and projecting and scanning your thoughts scanning your memories and everything as if somebody's with flashlight and and the color of, of red of course plays an important role and those the linear quality is important for me i use line as a very descriptive tool it is very structural and it's very um you know it, it's 
familiar to me and I try to utilize that from a smaller sketch to larger sketch to really mm -hmm. depict that roughness and the scratchiness of this raw expression. Um, mm -hmm. It has a lot of symbolism. It has a lot of uh, personal connection. However, you know, I want to connect with the audience at their level as well. And, you know, history is repeating, you know, the oppression and power control in 20th century in different country isn't too far from 21st century in the United States. We mm -hmm. are dealing with a similar problem. So it developed through uh, maybe eight months, honestly. It was wow. gone working in September, and I think I finished that, well, maybe even more in the spring. Mm -hmm. But it's important to keep that in native language, to use this expression. And I wanted to use this poster-like format to have this commanding power mm -hmm. uh, that has very, you know, effective way of expressing the ideas and control the population and dictate certain ideas. So, um, and during Soviet Union, that was one of the, you know, direct method of controlling and using as poster art, mm -hmm. uh, as a dictatorship and as a propaganda. But, you know, we are very familiar with the format, you know, instead of poster art, we use today billboards and televisions and social media. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a drawing, a very small drawing uh, from Drawing Sketch. And you can see how kind of chaotic study sketch and misproportions. But the idea, it was important for me to kind of stick to a certain color. And this is a larger canvas. Um, wow. I use, uh, again, I try to keep the linear quality in the sketch raw as, as, as it is. And I even appreciate the uneven canvas itself the edges of it so it should not be polished and perfectly executed uh, another large canvas untitled currently so, if i may there's a i've seen a couple of figures like this now where it almost looks like your subject is puking or <laughs> I, I mean i don't i don't know how else to put it some spewing <laughs> something no. coming out of their mouth is that this this child, this figure of a child, is actually trapped in the corner. Uh -huh. Yet the figure standing in the corner and those striped lines are actually bars. They could be mm -hmm. stripes of a flag. They can be bars of a cell. It mm -hmm. can be any some kind of captivity, a format that captures this innocent child or small figure. You know. And keeping this in the corner and just the idea of being in the corner is kind of repetitive and, and kind of haunting me to the, the feelings. You know, what you mentioned earlier that uh, being captured in the cage. Well, that's a very similar, similar um, idea. And uh, this is actually not a volume. Are you talking about the stars that are actually kind of uh, sort of like a shadow and light from from the figure? No, it looks like a mouth. Like the the, oh. is this the, the, the red, is it a red? Oh, you're face? talking about the figure on the left. On the okay. left, yeah, it looks like it's it's coming out of his mouth. And so the large, if you, if you squint your eyes, maybe you can recognize this is kind of just purposefully distorted hammer and sickle. Oh. At some point, it was a figure of a hammer and sickle, but no longer. It's no longer. It's so distorted, so mutated. Mm -hmm. It's so transform into current um ugly some kind of form that is no longer hammer and sickle guess what it still has an order it's still hammering and still present and still dominant oh. in our picture plane and perhaps in our life as well i want to relate to the sense of power and kind of remove ourselves for a moment from particular geographical location of USSR or Russia mm -hmm. or China. It's a lot broader and wider. And I know you and I were kind of thinking about not going into politics, but since we talk about symbol and what do they represent and what audience see, mm -hmm. yes, we recognize red color as a color of Soviets and you know communism, but it is very symbolical in the United States as well. You know, it's yeah. one of the most strongest color in the United States. Of course, here we look at 
this and read as a color of Christianity. It's the blood of Christ. Mm-hmm. It's a different powerful. However, it is present in our flag. It is very American color and the mm-hmm. elements of star. It also very powerful. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've seen stars in, in the other works too. There's lots of stars. Does that symbol symbolize America? Uh, in some way, but okay. stars were present in USSR culture mm-hmm. as well. But yeah. that's the idea. Yeah. We have so many similarities in our yeah. culture cultures. I have a funny story about um, stars in American culture. When I was a young child, um, of course, during the Soviet Union, we were not very exposed to uh, the truth itself and what's going on in the United States. And I saw some of the elements, American flag. So in my childhood, um, they taught us in school that when you get something really done, something really well, and it's some kind of achievement, they give you a star and they mm-hmm. place it on your um it's like a great book star. So you really can be, um, you can show and translate your achievements based on the quantity of your stars and the quality of your stars. So when, <laughs> when I was a young girl and I look at the American flag and I saw so many stars, the first that came in my mind, like, oh my God, this country must have done something really, really good to earn that many stars. Wow. So, so <laughs> the child interpretation and the meaning behind in my eyes so it is a very powerful element and we can interpret in a different ways and in this case there is some irony because you've noticed the stars are sort of like smiley faces you know eyeless no eyes just a smiley um a little detail a little sarcasm perhaps and yeah what is that word in russian in the bottom right Vlast sounds blast, but it's actually power. Okay, so that's power the right word for political, power. Political power, right? Okay, yeah, that's very Order interesting. Political power. So is, is this somewhat autobiographical too because of the postage stamps? You, you put yourself into this? Are you the little girl? Is that a little girl in the corner? Not necessarily me. You know, it is no. a, a child. It is a symbol of innocence. It is a symbol that can be recognized. And we all are this little figure trapped, captivated, captured by long bars of some kind of, you know, oppression and Mm -hmm. control and power, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to have a direct interpretation and, you know prescribed to certain ideas, you know. So the other study of my um, recent research is, of course, portraiture. I can't step away from the portrait. Yeah. Professor Vladimir Marchenkov, who also is Russian professor, professor of philosophy and aesthetics in the Ohio University, uh, Athens. Mm-hmm. And I met him just um, coincidentally, and we became, uh, I would call him a good friend and uh, I admire his work and he's a fascinating character and of course I want I asked him to model for me and I have created a few portraits and that was um, a watercolor ink study and this is uh, more serious still mm-hmm. not completed because I was working in May and I took some break and step away from this work and I still mm-hmm. need to go back and finish some details Professor Marchenko is sitting and um, the idea was to depict uh, a face of, you know, when you look from the distance, you see this American flag, but it's actually not American flag. It is just a fabric polyester from bought from Walmart. You know, it it was actually designed for outdoor uh, furniture. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with the flag. However, we read and in such a different way. And uh, I had a lot of questions regarding the display of this. Mm-hmm. The idea was to display this figure, a very important figure. Okay, that's uh, This is a portrait of my husband, Paul, and again, it's a quite recent work. This is why is this one called Sons? So this is again personal story, personal history. We we. We both have four children. I have two boys from previous marriage and Paul has two boys from previous marriage. And okay. this is more about the fatherhood. You know, we often talk about the motherhood and the, the presence of, uh, you know, female parent and relationship. But with mm-hmm. this painting, I wanted to emphasize 
uh, bring more attention on fatherhood and how important it is. Mm -hmm. You know, often when I think about and when I began teaching, I was wanted to move away from politics and think about you know, I'm not a political and I don't consider myself political, but it's such a it ties up to politics. Everything is uh, intertwined together with each other, and I always thought you know. Politics starts in our kitchen, the way we build relationship with our children, with our parents, with each other, with siblings. You know, it's such a fundamental um, base for the the future, you know, and mm -hmm. in the relationship and as far as to fathers and sons, it is important. And absence of sons is the that heavy um, topic that. You know, I wanted to bring, of course, it is based on personal experience. I don't want to go into the depth of it, but mm -hmm. it is a depiction of absence of songs mm -hmm. that could be, should be there, but mm -hmm. are not. Yeah, it's a, it's a very striking piece because it's very, um, you created a great deal of isolation in this piece. And and he has kind of a, again, kind of a far away look in his eye. I mean, the way you handled his face is just beautiful. Thank you. What What's the size of this? Is this another large piece? About 60 inches wide. Wow. Large canvas. And this is a stretch on frame canvas. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, is this on display somewhere? Is this in your basement or? It is in my studio, currently in my, uh, not home studio, but at the university studio. Wow. Mm -hmm. Just the, the feeling of isolation I get looking at is it's a very soft to me it's somber. I don't know. Huh. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Can I move to the next? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, feel free. This is my portrait. We talk about this and okay, yeah. we'll see it. I just wanted to show you a few, yeah. A few. Yeah, minutes. I was gonna ask you what, what else you're working on. Do you have do you ever have any um showings at like local galleries in Columbus or anything like that? Yeah, since I've had for the past 20 years, ever since I immigrated, I've been actively involved in shows all over in different states from California, New York to Miami, Atlanta, Georgia. So mm -hmm. Well, excellent. This has been great. Thank you so much for being on here. And um, I'll definitely keep in touch with you. Send me out any information if you have showings or any happenings going on around Columbus or, or Athens. Peter, thank you so much. Yeah. Have a great day. Have a good night. You too. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.